computer going live on the book of the face. You'll see a live Facebook on a second. Page I manage, transaction council. Preparing stream. One second. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Veterans Action Council Roundtable number 11, Pathfinders, Raiders to Researchers, with Brian Buckley of the Hellman Valley Growers Company and Battle Brothers Foundation. My name is <clears throat> Etienne Fontan. I am with the Veterans Action Council. I am a combat veteran from Desert Storm, and I was serving with the West Virginia Army National Guard. Uh, today, we have special guest is uh, Mr. Brian Buckley. And we uh, welcome Brian, not only uh, for what he's doing for the veteran community, but also as a Veterans Action Council member. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, great to be here. Uh, basically gonna get right into things here. Uh, as you know, it's been a pretty exciting uh, week for you specifically, Brian, uh, with things going on uh, in the uh, world of, of science. You have basically caused a bit of a stir. Uh, basically, you're uh, causing a, a study design uh, for uh, an actual human test on using real world cannabis today, not necessarily provided by uh, NIDA or <clears throat> the FDA. So um, talking about your study design, how was it created? And were any studies submitted in support of what you're doing, uh, providing cannabis to veterans? So the first thing that we did when we partnered with Niamedic, um, we started looking at what other research was conducted uh, throughout the world and also looked at America. And we wanted to look at what were some of the limitations. And we saw that, you know, if you go down the route of an institutional or an academic IRB, you will be tied into the NIDA program, which is the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And we definitely wanted to avoid that. We just really, I know there were studies with NIDA, some have been published, some haven't, and I think some are about to come out. Uh, but we felt that we get the best results that if we could go down the route of a private IRB, that would help us uh, have a little bit more control of the medicine and actually be able to start manipulating uh, the uh, um, cultivate, cultivars as we needed to uh, in order to get the best impact for the veterans. Um, you know, we, we were going to look at like, you know, could we just do cannabis and post-traumatic stress disorder? We have a terrific uh, doctor who's in charge of our uh, research. Uh, it goes by the name of Dr. Victor Novak. Um, he's an Israeli. He works with Niamedic. Uh, he also at one point uh, was har in charge of uh, Harvard's uh, Clinical Research Institute and has done numerous FDA trials. And that's when he said, you know, we kind of have to walk this in and we might not want to say, hey, medical cannabis can cure post-traumatic stress disorder, but maybe go about it in a way of, let's see if we can attack the symptoms. Um, and that's when we said, okay, we'll just go after the sleep, the pain, the anxiety, and see how we can work on each individual symptom. And then uh, what was kind of the difficult part when we submitted for uh, the IRB was essentially they haven't seen many private IRBs come across. So there was a lot of education with that in terms of working with the uh, IRB. Uh, but through uh, works and going back and forth and retreating protocols and things of that nature, uh, we eventually got the approval. But, you know, I can't thank enough the people who went before us and really blazed that trail in terms of doing the research and showing some of the positives and some of the shortcomings. So we try to just, you know, learn from some of the things that held them back and also for us to move uh, forward and be a little more progressive. And, you know, probably some people out there are kind of wondering, what is an institutional review board? It is very complex. I uh, ask you all to, you know, Google it real quick and you can see it. But I really have a full breakdown. Okay. 
and ATN's got it. But basically, the big thing with it is um, it means we can do human trials uh, with medical cannabis. And yes, uh, it was basically which led me into our next question, which was what was the rationale for a private IRB? And I was going to explain to the audience uh, an institutional review board or which is basically an independent ethics committee that applies research ethics, uh, basically reviewing methods proposed for research to ensure that they are ethical. So they're basically overseeing to making sure that they're following proper scientific protocol in the end. And of course, specifically since they're dealing with humans, it's, a, it's extremely complicated and has a, uh, a, a lot to it, needless to say. How long did you say it took you to uh, put this fully together? How many years? Really, the, uh, the concept was uh, created prior towards the end of 2016. Uh, we met uh, Alain Blot from uh, Niamatic. I met him at a UCLA a cannabis symposium. And, um, you know, it was probably one of the best coffee breaks I ever had in my life. I mean, we were in there listening to uh, Dr. Jeffrey Chen and the initiatives they wanted to take up at uh, UCLA. Gave us a coffee break, um, just kind of sitting there. And um, this gentleman, Alain Blot, walked up to me and I explained to him what we wanted to do, what the crisis was with our veterans. Uh, him being an Israeli, he obviously has served in the military and he understands uh, post-traumatic stress, especially people in Israel. And he was all about it. And, um, you know, through, I mean, it, it took a long time, guys. It really was, um, you know, we were, we, we started putting the design together or looking at it. We were looking at the funding and it, it's going to be a very expensive thing to do, as you guys could imagine. For example, this study design alone was upwards around $50,000 to put together. And, you know, through that, we said, how can we do this and how can we help fund this and maybe make people more aware? And that's when we came up with the concept of our uh, recreational uh, company, or what we like to refer to as our for purpose uh, company, Hellman Valley Growers Company. And, you know, we literally were looking at a Paul Newman salad dressing bottle and said 100% of profits to charity. And we're like, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And we talked to the CPAs and the lawyers and said, that is totally legit. You guys can do that. So we figured let's launch Hellman Valley Growers Company, help spread the word of what we're trying to do. And hopefully the cannabis community will embrace us and help us. And with 100% of our profits that are purchased from our recreational brand goes right back to our uh, cannabis research. Um, it, it, it was tremendous. I mean, we started off here down in Southern California. I'm located in San Diego and um, people really took into it. So we ended up getting around about $50,000 after a couple months of, uh, you know, of our work. And that's when we started making our payments to the institution uh, to uh, NIAMAG to start putting the study design together. It took them probably about two months to put the design and we submitted back in June of 20. We felt very positive going into it. But again, it was a whole education process. Uh, we even brought in consultants who have uh, performed uh, IRBs with cannabis and to help us work and to help work with the IRB. And, you know, eventually back in, I think it was uh, end of or mid February, well, we got the, the green light for it. I think it was like February 12th or something they, they approved. And, um, you know, off we went. So uh, there was a lot to it, just not even the study design alone. I mean, you had to submit all your marking material that we're going to have out there so they could review that to make sure everything lined up exactly as the design was and the protocols were the same. Um, so it was really time intensive, but I just couldn't thank, uh, you know, the great medical team that we're working with at Niamatic, along with uh, some of the doctors at UC Ir Irvine who jumped onto our study to really help us and, uh, you know, get it through. I mean, I'll be the first one to say, I'm just kind of the guy with the ideas, um, but they're the ones who made it happen. So what was the rationale for a private IRB as opposed to going through the entire government process? Absolutely. Um, you know, as, as we kind of mentioned before, there, there's a lot of red tape where you have to work with. If you're working with the NIDA program, which they have a DEA license, you too have to obtain a DEA license. Um, that was part of the education process that we had to go through with the IRB saying, you know, since we're doing a private IRB, we don't require to do that. And we're using, you know, products that you can purchase in a dispensary. Um, but we just really felt like instead of trying to climb that mountain and, and working, you know, through all the government red tape, we would just kind of make a workaround and go on the private side where not only can we collect that and see what is working, but then we have the ability to go back and design uh, a cannabis stream that would 
essentially be somewhat of a super medicine that, that could help out and uh, with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So it just gives us a lot more flexibility. And I think at the end of the day, it will be a lot more impactful. And having it being independent is more than anything. Uh, that's the, the proof for the science, which is extremely needed. So uh, <clears throat> we're very excited about this. Uh, one of our other uh, council members, council member George Armstrong, please introduce yourself and uh, ask your question to council member Brian Buckley. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is George Armstrong. I served in the army from 1985 to 1993. Um, and I would like to ask Mr. Buckley um, about what future studies um, do you plan on conducting and will the future studies uh, remain in the, the state of California? Great question. So speaking in kind of military terms, we're going at this about a three phase approach. We initially were trying to get a pilot study approved that we could start providing the veterans with uh, the medicine, they come back and we could start doing the treatment with them and give them a recommended treatment protocol. Um, the IRB, you know, looked at it, they understood what we were trying to do, but they kind of, you know, and I understand they wanted to pump the brakes a little bit. And they came back and said, let's do an observational at first and then kind of build off of that. So this is more or less our launching uh, pad here where we're gonna work with 60 veterans in California and we'll go through an observational IRB with them. The study will be approximately 90 days per veteran going through. They will uh, do a phone screening and then they'll come in for a non-invasive physical with the doctors at Niamedic and uh, the doctors at UC Irvine. And um, they'll be told kind of what to do and they'll go out and purchase their cannabis. And then for the next three weeks, every seven days, they'll receive a phone call from the doctors at Niamedic just to check in and see how they're doing on that. Uh, then at that point, they'll be, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully have some things dialed in. They'll uh, be on their own for about the next two months. And then we bring them in for uh, the final uh, visit. And we'll kind of do the, the final parts of what we do during the interview process and how did they do during the study. And it's nice too, it's a uh, perspective IRB. So it means that we can help them out. Uh, you know, if they go through, for example, and they make it, they will get a gift card at the end and everything like that. Uh, so we're able to retain them and, and motivate them to kind of stick to the whole tire uh, treatment that we're doing with them. Once we uh, gather all the information from this first study, we'll go back and we'll uh, design what we think will be a, an appropriate um, medical cannabis uh, strain that can help out the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And then we look to do another uh, study here in California again, as of now with 200 veterans. So it'll be a little bit more robust and we'll go through that treatment. Once that hits the way that we anticipate it will, we are looking at a couple different states that we would like to move into and we'll do a third and final study, which will be a retrospective IRB. And we'll go through and just see that we can confirm the results that we found here in California. We're getting similar or, you know, exact same results uh, as we are in this other state that we can prove that, hey, you know, look at it like Coca-Cola. If you get a Coca-Cola in California and get a Coca-Cola in Texas or a Coca-Cola in France, it all tastes like Coke. And that's essentially what we want to do is if you try the product, it's going to be the same here in California as it would in Pennsylvania and Maine and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we we were kind of talking about, could we bring in other veterans uh, from different states in here? And, you know, I love how Dr. Novak explained it. He goes, you know, we call this practicing medicine for a reason. He's like, this is something relatively new and we're gonna be learning as well. So we didn't wanna have a situation where say, we have a veteran in Florida and we need to meet with them real quick or do something and versus, you know, having them fly from Florida back here would just be a little bit easier just to have them in the state of California for uh, location periods. But, um, you know, the ultimate goal is that we want to get this in the hands of uh, all the veterans uh, once we prove uh, the study that it actually works. Thank you for that, Brian. It was very informative. I uh, would like to uh, welcome uh, council member Ricardo Prieta. Would you please introduce yourself and ask your question to council member Brian Buckley? Yep, yep. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm Ricardo Pareda. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. I served in the United States Army Military Police Corps from 2003 to 2009. Uh, medically retired in 2009, rated 100% permanent total from the VA. Uh, Mr. Buckley, I just wanna, uh, looking into the future, kind of projecting a bit, 
beyond post-traumatic stress, what is it that your company is uh, hoping to investigate, right? Such as like, are you, do you have any plans on looking into traumatic brain injury, CTE, et cetera? You know, I, that is another great question. And I think there's a lot there. Um, right now, we're just going to focus on the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. But we do have a lot of interest in, you know, hey, if we knock down this one big domino that says, okay, it is working to help with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, well, what else can it do? And we've had some, you know, very terrific conversations with some of the doctors. And, uh, you know, I want to get you guys on the phone with them as well, because <clears throat> every time you speak with them, you just learn something new. But we actually started talking about football players and when they experience concussions. And really, the doctors at Niamedic said, in reality, if you had an NFL player and we all know, you know, if you watch NFL, you kind of understand what happens. If they look concussed or something happened, they go into the blue tent and they get an examination. They really feel like, you know, if you deem that that player at that moment has a concussion, the best thing you could do for them at that uh, time period would be to start giving them medical cannabis because it will help reduce the brain swelling and enhance the, uh, um, um, sorry, as it was, and then uh, also enhance their recovery time. And, you know, we've talked with um, some players who, who were in the NFL and, you know, some of them come out and said, you know, they're former players or like, you know, my entire NFL career, some of them being over a decade said, you know, I use cannabis my entire NFL career, um, you know, instead of going out and drinking and doing all that stuff. So we kind of threw it around and this is more of just like kind of like a maybe this would be kind of interesting to look at is if we did an EEG on the brains of some of the players who did put in, in the NFL, who did use cannabis and some of the players who were in the NFL and didn't use cannabis and just kind of look at their brainwave activity and see if there is something there. Now, obviously now we're getting a little more sophisticated with cannabis and people understand certain strains and this and that, you know, some of the guys back then they're like, it, it was weed, you know, if someone had something, we just use this. Well, we don't really know what exactly they were using that helped but I think it could be a good launching point. And the great thing too, is you're seeing a lot of, um, you know, you see UFC is getting a little more progressive. The NFL is kind of getting there. Major League Baseball and hockey are kind of getting there where I think the appetite is there to say, hey, maybe this might help out, not just with CTE or TBI, but also other recoveries to help the athletes get a little more healthier versus going out and drinking and doing all that stuff, which would just, you know, makes things worse for you, obviously. Thank you very much, uh, council member. And uh, that's great answers. Uh, it's wonderful to know. So what uh, research questions are you looking to answer through this research? You know, this initial one, we just want to see, will cannabis help out with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder? We're not going to come out and say cannabis, bang, it's going to heal post-traumatic stress, but maybe it can help out with the sleep, or maybe it helps out with their anxiety, or maybe it helps out with the pain. Um, you know, for someone like me, uh, you know, I'll just say everyone, I, I, I too, um, hundred percent disabled and, uh, have been deemed hundred percent, uh, post-traumatic stress as well. And what I really suffer from is not so much, uh, the actions on the battlefield against the enemy. It was more or less the unfortunate people who get wrapped up. Um, as many people know, it's not like, um, you know, civil war days or anything like that where you just meet on a battlefield and you have at it. Uh, you're fighting in people's neighborhoods, essentially. And for me, just seeing some of the uh, things where the enemies would use um, women and children as human targets, and even though we we would always expose ourselves to greater danger to ensure that we got it right and uh, eliminated the, the, the appropriate threat, um, you know, that's not always the case. And, you know, I, I really think it really started kicking off for me pretty hard was when I started having kids and really having the anxiety at nighttime and not able to sleep. And, you know, what I think all of us can say, we all probably have, and, you know, if you're a veteran, you might not know this, but we all have hypervigilance. Like every time you're out on a patrol, you're looking for IEDs, you're looking for enemy sniper fire, you're looking in tree lines, you're looking at all this stuff that could potentially uh, cause a threat to you. And, you know, for me every day, I might walk into a room and I still kind of do the motion of, you know, not like I have a gun in my hand, I'm doing anything crazy, but I will scan a room, I will look for threats, and I'll do all that, uh, which sometimes can get a little crazy. I mean, even when I'm with my kids, I'll think about two or three steps ahead of them, like, well, they're going here, they're going to climb on this thing, they might do this, it might fall over, and I'm like already kind of reacting to it, um, which isn't healthy, you know, you kind of have to let kids be kids. So really, you know, long about answer, but really just want to see what symptoms of post-traumatic stress 
can medical cannabis help? And then we're going to build off of that. That's very powerful. <clears throat> um, so you are a combat veteran yourself. And uh, so why are you and the Hellman Valley's Growers Association, Growers Company, pardon me, uh, why are you guys doing this? Why, uh, what has inspired you? What, what makes you tick? Yeah, that's, um, you know, I was just talking about this earlier and apologies if I get emotional, but um, really guys, my, my heart and everything's into this. Um, you know, when I left the military for me, it was very difficult for me to uh, watch the news um, for about a year or two. Uh, you know, news cycle, I got out at, an, at the end of 2013 and news cycle was still very much showing what the, uh, the actions were going on in Afghanistan. And then obviously, you know, down the line, things in uh, Iraq ramped back up again with the emergence of ISIS. Um, and I really had a lot of guilt that I wasn't there fighting anymore. Um, not that I quit or anything like that. I mean, I did nine years and it was just kind of my time. And um, those were, those were some tough times and I kind of lost my identity. Um, you know, I, I just, I had a really great paying job and I had some really good people there, but it just wasn't really fulfilling me. And when my, uh, when our lead uh, cultivator, Andy Myers, who also served with me in the Marine Raiders, um, you know, we were all probably, we had a really bad summer in 2012. Um, you know, we lost a lot of good guys and, uh, you know, it was a really tough one. And I just think, you know, like many, we were just kind of finding the uh, bottom of a bottle to try to subdue the pain that we were going through. And Andy one time just looked really, really good. And I'm just like, Hey, like what, what's going on here? And he's like, well, you ready for this one? And he's like, I gave up a fifth of Jack for a joint. And you're kind of like, Whoa, like what? Like, you know, and me back then, I mean, I wasn't thinking anything cannabis. It just like, not that I had a problem with people using it. I just figured it was something people did. Um, and he's like, listen, man, it's great. He's like, I'm not blacking out. I'm not drinking and driving. He's like, when I get up in the morning, I feel great. I feel refreshed. And then he's like, and I'm really getting into cultivation and it's helping me transition from a warrior to a gardener. And I just thought that was so impactful. So we established our nonprofit called Battle Brothers Foundation. And we wanted to do a three-tier approach of a personal medical and economic on the personal side, kind of like a big brother, big sister, just kind of help that, you know, active duty individual transition to uh, the veteran life. Uh, we were looking at things where veterans were suffering with uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, alcoholism, opiate abuse, and, you know, we're able to get veterans into uh, treatment facilities just to let them take a knee for a little bit, kind of recalibrate themselves and, uh, you know, get back to life and uh, live that dream that they fought so hard to defend. And then we wanted to do job placement on our economic phase. But after Andy said that to me, I'm like, man, there, there might be something here. So naturally, I went out and tried cannabis myself and loved it. So uh, that was a, a good positive sign. And we discussed about, you know, how can we make things move here? And, you know, there's some great advocacy groups out there and they've done a ton of hard work and we're definitely jumping off their backs for all the, 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 the trail that they blaze for us. But we just started thinking like, maybe we could do something a little bit more impactful and move the dial here and prove it with data. I had an opportunity to talk to some members of Congress, and that's when they told us, you know, if you can get data and you need to have American doctors part of the study, you're going to have a very good debate here with people. And they even said, they're like, listen, people are dug in. The people who were not believers but got moved by some of the great veteran groups out there advocating what's done for them, they're already over on that side. But you have a majority of people who are saying, no, not until I see data, not until I see hard numbers, not until I can say something clearly like, listen, I've looked at that, I've seen it work and it, it is proven medically. And that's when we decide, hey, we got to jump all in and, and do some uh, research here and prove it. And again, we started with the Helmet Valley Growers Company as pretty much a conduit to help get our word, get our message out there, hopefully be embraced by the cannabis community, which we have been, and have 100% of our profits uh, go forward to our veteran medical cannabis research. But at the end of the day, I always think to myself, you know, what have I done for a veteran? And, you know, and it drives me every day, every day I think about that. And I just really, you know, you just think about what these brave men and women have done for all of us. And, you know, they raised their right hand and went forward and, you know, signed a blank check that's uh, payable with their lives. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, they go forward and they come back here and they might not be 
they're here physically, but maybe spiritually they're not. And I just think, you know, we here, all of us, everyone here in the Veterans Action Committee is, uh, Council as well, you know, we can help them live that American dream that they fought so hard to defend. And I was asked a great question the other day on a radio show, and they asked, like, well, what about my critics who might say that this is a gateway? And I agreed with them. It is a gateway. It's a gateway for these brave men and women to go live the peace that they deserve and live the American dream they fought so hard to defend. Wow. Beautiful. Uh, it's good to know uh, how inspired, uh, you know, and what uh, driven individuals can do uh, when given some opportunity, needless to say. Uh, right. I would like to uh, welcome council member David Bass. Uh, David Bass, please introduce yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, my name is Dave Bass. I served in the army for 25 years. I founded uh, Texas Veterans for Medical Marijuana in 2015. Uh, we're down here in uh, the Lone Star State um, using cannabis as outlaws illegally, uh, but trying to make it legal. Uh, uh, Brian, uh, we put that article about your study on our social media here in Texas, uh, and it got a lot of interest, a, a lot of likes, a lot of comments. Uh, people are very interested uh, in this study. Um, so my question is, I actually have two questions. Uh, question number one, uh, will the veterans uh, choose their own strains and their own dosing regimen? Uh, and how will you document that? And then my second question is, uh, are, do these veterans have to submit uh, actual, some type of medical certification that they've actually been diagnosed with PTSD? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm really interested in this study. No, those are two great questions. And uh, first off, you got to get me one of those hats. That thing rocks. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so what will happen is, yeah, the veterans will go out, they will purchase uh, their medical cannabis, and it's going to be very journal intensive. So they're going to be asked to say, you know, at what time and how much did you take and how did you feel kind of, you know, there's gonna be a little bit more to it, but that's kind of the wave tops, right? Um, and then the, the second part, um, I'm sorry, David, can you ask me a second part again? Sorry. You know, I've met a lot of veterans in Texas who have obvious symptoms of PTSD, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, you know, they, they weren't actually diagnosed with PTSD before they got out of the service. A lot of times they were just blown off. Nobody even wanted to talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. And then other times, um, uh, they weren't diagnosed and they've tried to go through the VA process and found that to be really difficult. Uh, so my question is that the veterans who participate in your study, uh, will they need to show actual certification that they've been diagnosed by, by a medical professional with PTSD? Yes, thank you for that. So what they'll do, they're going to need their medical records. Uh, the doctors will go through and examine everything they've been through and look at it. And then they also will have a DSM-5 uh, CAPS test that they'll go through. And that will indicate what their level of post-traumatic stress is. Perfect. That's really good. I mean, that that's, um, in my opinion, exactly uh, how to do it and get and get really interesting results. Thank you. Right on. <clears throat> I would like to uh, welcome uh, Council Member Sonny Welsh. Uh, Sonny, please introduce yourself uh, and your service and uh, ask your question to uh, Council Member Brian Buckley. Please unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you so much, Etienne. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am a 10-year veteran of the cannabis industry, but no active service or military history in my personal background. I am, however, a civilian ally working to establish a B2B platform to help uh, veteran business owners network in the plant medicine space, creating a more cohesive environment there, I think would be um, you know, pay dividends in the, in the future. My major question for Brian is, what, if any, of the responses that you've received from the announcement of this research has surprised you? Um, there's been a lot of press all over the country about this new groundbreaking uh, effort that you guys are pushing forward. And I'm wondering if any doors have opened that you didn't know were there for future partnerships or support. Yeah, great question. And first off, Sonny, you know, thank you for being here and thank you for everything you're doing for the veterans community. Um, that's really important to all of us. 
Uh, it's amazing. Um, just having people like you who, you know, when we all come back home, we got people like you that want to make sure that we're taken care of. So uh, cheers to you on, on your in initiatives. Um, you know, I, I would say overall, everything's been really positive. I think there were some surprises, but um, yeah, as soon as we made the announcement, a lot of doors opened. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, doctors are reaching out to us, uh, asking us to speak at some of their events. Um, really interested. I mean, you know, I was kind of, I was having a conversation with Rico the other night and we just, it seemed like we, we kind of not, you know, it's better to be lucky than good sometimes, but I think we really hit this thing at the right time at the right moment, if that makes sense, where people open-minded to cannabis. I mean, you're kind of seeing where we were in 2016 versus now where we are in 2021. You're seeing states start going on the medical or recreational. Some are going right to recreational. So the appetite is there and it's just been really impactful. And even, um, you know, I'm very humbled. Um, you know, I, I would say the team that I'm with, they do all the work and I'm just kind of the fat guy behind the desk who gets up every now and then gives a press conference. But, uh, you know, um, it, just the national media is taking a really big interest. And, uh, you know, we have some allies out there who really want to help and pump this up and get the word out. So I figured, you know, hey, this is going to be really interesting. I think people, it's going to be something kind of new where, hey, veterans are now looking to help other veterans where, you know, this is something maybe the, you know, the government could have got behind a little bit sooner, but that's fine. That's why we're America. If we want to do something, you know, individuals can get up and raise their hand and say, I'll take it, I'll go. Um, but yeah, it's been extremely positive, really no negative impacts. And I mean, I would say I've even heard from, you know, generals that I used to serve with and colonels and people who were, you know, non-believers whatsoever. And they're really jumping onto it and, you know, wishing us the best of luck. I mean, I had uh, one colonel who's a, you know, really dear friend of mine and just a great guy I got to serve with. Um, when I went into the Marine Corps at first, I started off in the infantry in 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, and he was my battalion commander. He was also from Philadelphia, so it just kind of worked. But um, he, he made a comment one time to someone out in the Philadelphia area where he said, I never thought I'd say this in a million years but we need to do more veteran medical cannabis research. And he's like, and you guys need to get a hold of my, my man, Brian Buckley out in California. And just a lot of people are starting to call and a lot of people want to help. So it's truly been a blessing. And, you know, like anything in life, it, it takes a village. And um, I just really feel great that it seems like the whole entire community, not just veteran community, but again, the cannabis community where, listen, we're, we're new kids on the block. We're, you know, we, we didn't have to go through all the trials and tribulations. Some of the people, even some people on this council had to go through. Um, but it's just been great because I really believe people understand where we are. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer. If you keep your moral compass pointed true north, good things are going to happen to you. And just some great people um, have come up and want to help out. And, you know, in particular, the Veterans Action Council reached out to me and said, hey, how can we help? And would you like to join? And we can do this together. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I count my blessings every every day. I get to get on the phone with uh, with all these uh, men and women, and uh, you know, hopefully, here we'll make history and help out our veterans. Absolutely, thank you very much, uh, Sunny Welsh, for uh, your question, and uh, we'll take it over now to Council Member Michael Krawitz. Uh, please introduce yourself and ask your question. Great, man. Thanks, Dan. So I'm Michael Krawitz, I'm a U.S. Air Force vet, served 81 to 86, uh, took over the uh, Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access in 2008. We uh, were the ones who negotiated the first ever VA marijuana policy in 2010, updated in 2017. Um, I actually have a couple questions for you. I guess best way I just ask you one and then we'll come back to the second one. But the first one is, uh, I was just thinking as, as we're talking, yeah, it's been very difficult, if not impossible, to do certain kinds of studies with cannabis. As we all know, it's become very well known since Dr. Sisley has sort of broken that whole thing open over the last few years, that if you want to do a certain kind of human study that might show uh, actual promise, uh, double-blind placebo-based study um, with, with cannabis as a medicine, that the National Institute of Drug Abuse just wouldn't allow you to do that study. Uh, by not allowing you to have the cannabis because you can only do those types of studies with the cannabis from the federal government. Otherwise, all the other cannabis is, quote, illegal because it's not legal under federal law. It's only legal under state law. Uh, but your strategy is different. You, you're using an observational study strategy that I guess 
theoretically could have been done years ago. So I guess my question is, do you, do you think that this kind of study would have been able to be done years ago? Would it have been useful to be done years ago? Or uh, would, would that, you think that the reason why we haven't seen those kind of studies is because people just weren't thinking forward enough and open-minded enough or, or that, um, uh, you know, that they were blocked? Uh, just looking for your kind of your insight on that. Yeah, and Dr. Sisley definitely did open up some doors and I remember uh, hearing her at an event and you know that was part of the inspiration of going for a private IRB because she, she explained all the shortcomings of what she had to deal with uh, with the NIDA program. You know, that it's a terrific question and that's, I don't know who could answer it, you know, when they finally kind of said, okay, we're open to more different types of studies. Um, you know, some of the good things we did have in our corner is Niamedic has done studies in Israel. They have shown that it does work with uh, people who suffer from post-traumatic stress, from people who are in the Holocaust, um, all the way to their soldiers and everyone in between. So I think that gave us some good ground. And, you know, I think, again, we thought this thing was going to be a slam dunk as soon as we sent it in in June. We thought it might be like a month or two when we get approval. But we had to do a lot of work and we had to do some corrections and move things around and just really stay the course. I mean, there were some times where we're, we're like, is this going to happen? Uh, this isn't some great news, but we kind of were persistent and we just worked with the IRB to see what they were, would approve. So I don't know, you know, in 2018, could you have done this study? My gut says no. I, I think they might have been kind of a little more closed minded to it. But again, I think it's the whole entire atmospherics that's happening in our country and some of the positive results we're seeing in other countries. And, you know, Michael, some of the great work you've done on the international level definitely uh, helped to contribute to this. Um, I think they finally said, OK, you know, we're, we're open to it. Again, we wanted to do a little bit more of an advanced study. And they're like, hey, hold your horses. Let's kind of do this one first and let's see what uh, kind of fruit it bears. Um, but, yeah, I think overall, I think it was just, again, it was the right timing and in, in the right part in our history where I believe people are a little bit more open-minded to see what this can do. And, and there's a lot more people calling for cannabis research. So um, yeah, I think we just kind of hit it at the right time. And, and my follow-up question is, you know, kind of, if you could just give us an idea of what you see of the big picture of this. I mean, how, how does your study that you're working on right now fit into the big picture of improving or, or helping to create better patient access. Yeah, and that's a great, uh, great phrase there, access. That is the end state here. Obviously, we're going to do our two studies here in California, and then we'll move the third study into a different state. And then once we prove that and there's like little to no deviation, uh, I believe that's a really good time when we can go in front of Congress and say, hey, we need to kind of move this forward and, and start doing the FDA trials and doing the double blinds and all that uh, that associates with it. And our ultimate end state is to get medical cannabis into the VA medical system. I would love nothing more than a veteran to walk in and say, I'm dealing with this anxiety. I have sleep issues and all this. And they're like, well, you know what? You need to get a gram of blank. And this is going to help you out. And we're going to prescribe it to you and go down to the pharmacy and pick it up. And what will be a terrific byproduct from this is I always tell people post-traumatic stress isn't a, a military issue. It's a human condition. Everyone can suffer from post-traumatic stress. So I really don't believe the federal government will just open up like, hey, only veterans can get medical cannabis. I think it will open up the doors to all patients in uh, in our country that will be able to have access. And I believe federal uh, federally, they'll make medical cannabis legal. Thank you very much, uh, council member. That was uh, some great questions. Uh, we'll take it back to uh, Ricardo Pereira. Uh, he has another question for you. Couple of them, uh, like a serious one, and then just kind of a fun one. Serious too, but uh, fun, just kind of enlightening. Uh, you, you've gone through this private RB process. You've been successful getting it to this point. Now you're looking to kick off the next leg of this journey. What has your relationship been like with academia in your state? And when you move to another state, are you anticipating? a relationship that's similar to one that you've had in your home state or something else, new field, new, new ball, new rules. And then my other question is, uh, what kind of strains have you personally found to be uh, beneficial for what it is that you're looking to sue? Yeah, um, what 
you know, it's, it's been really interesting. I think at first, um, academia was very interested in what we're doing. Uh, we talked with a couple of uh, universities and they were like, wow, that's tremendous. We wish you guys the best of luck and we love what you guys are doing, but we can't touch you. Um, cause they all receive federal grants and all that stuff. And they're like, Hey, if we go forward with something of this nature, we might not be able to fund our kickball team. Um, so it was a little bit kind of like, you know, go forward, do great things. And we hope to hear back from you. But, you know, as things started moving, uh, some more doors started opening up. And again, this is just a theory of mine, but I remember reading, I think it was like last summer, University of Pennsylvania said, you know, we want to go and do medical cannabis research, but we want to use private farms. We do not want to work with the NIDA community. Now you got an Ivy League school kind of coming out and saying that, which, you know, is a great thing. And, you know, as we were going through this, we're like, okay, we're going to use the facilities at UC Irvine. We're going to have a couple of doctors with us, our American doctors, but they're not affiliated with UCI. And then literally about I think like a month or two ago, they came out and said, Hey, we would like to be a part of this and, and, and get on to the study. And they're going to work a couple of things on their end. So it was really opened up a lot of doors there. And, you know, we're getting kind of similar uh, feedback from some uh, doctors I've talked to over at Harvard and Yale and some other areas where people are getting really interested. And I think with the momentum that we build off of this first one, I think that's going to continue to happen. And I think uh, some uh, academic institutions would like to, uh, uh, work with us on that side, which is great. It just helps us validate it more. And I encourage them all to start doing their studies and seeing if they can do a University of Pennsylvania model where they can start working with private farms where they can get a little bit better data than they would with uh, working with NIDA. And, you know, for me, uh, it's really been a couple of things. I mean, I have a, you know, it, it we really built our first uh, cultivars were built off of feedback we got from veterans, which what works for them. So we would have like an Afghanimal we had a, a sour diesel and we had a purple train wreck. Um, you know, for me, um, one of the nice things of being a, an owner of a cannabis company, you get to kind of make things you like, right? So uh, really for me, that's helped me out like daytime wise, I really enjoy would be a train wreck. Uh, and then also our Afghanimal, uh, which has like a, the, you know, the Mersine Terps and everything. We're just seeing a lot of positive with that. Uh, that really helps me with sleep. Um, I actually gave it to a couple uh, medical professionals who tried it and they freaked out. They're like, this is exactly what the medicine should do for us. The one gentleman told me, he goes, you know, my routine is I will take a couple hits of a vape pen when I'm making my dinner just to kind of warm up my endocannabinoid system. And then before I go to bed, I'll usually smoke a joint and that'll kind of put me down. And they were like, you know, I never felt so just relaxed and so good and just in a great state of mind after using Afghanimal. And then they're like, so instead of my joint, I said, I want to smoke more Afghanimal. So they tried that and it put them down and they said, I haven't had a night of sleep like that in a long time. And that's the same for me. I mean, I can get up in the middle of the night, do what I have to do and I can go back into my bed and I'm back asleep in a couple of minutes. I don't have to watch ESPN for like three hours or something or some infomercial. Um, it definitely helped out there. Um, and then also what I'm really getting into is live resin sauce. Um, I had one from a, another company, uh, CBX was the first one I um, actually tried and I just loved it. Um, you know, it wasn't nothing super high THC. I think the thing came in at like 67%. It was fantastic. So again, you have a cannabis company, you can make what you like. So we developed our own um, uh, live resin and it's a Sunday driver. And again, it is tremendous. I mean, I love using that nighttime. If, if I just want to go out and social and have fun with my friends, I can use that. No need to drink a beer or anything that I can have a club soda and a lime and I'm good. And, you know, but I'm still not at that like super high euphoric reason where I'm kind of couch locked, if you would. I can still function and do what I have to do, but just my entire body is relaxed and I feel good. So that's what has been working for me. All right, uh, Rico, did you have any other questions? No, thank you very much. That was enlightening. That was good. All right, we'll go to uh, Council Member George Armstrong. You had a question for Council Member Biden. Yes, um, actually, Brian, I've got I've got two. I'd like to um, first of all ask: Are you in contact with the VA? Uh, is there plans to be in for future contact with the VHA? Um, does the does the VHA have any understanding of, of what you're doing and is there communications going on? And then um, kind of just for fun, 
I would like to ask about the uh, Hellman Valley Growers Company, the name itself. So um, if you could fill us in on that story, because I think it speaks to the, um, the brotherhood of the company itself and the, the theories that it was founded behind. Uh, I appreciate that question. Yeah, with the VA in terms, uh, we have talked with some members. Um, they are aware. Again, um, I, I do support the VA. I think they're doing the best they can with what they have. But being a federal agency and cannabis being a Schedule One narcotic, clearly there's limitations there. So what we want to do is basically start sharing the data toward to them let them know what we're doing and see if they have any feedback. And I, I kind of look at it like a fence, right? So we'll throw the ball over, let them know what we're doing and they'll throw the ball back over with some questions and we'll just kind of keep going back and forth and back and forth. Um, so we want to be extremely transparent with everyone. There's no hidden agenda here. Uh, at the end of the day, we're just here to try to help our veterans. Um, and so that's how that will kind of work. So as things continue to mature here and we get things going with our study, we want to be more actively engaged with them and share our data with them. And um, again, I really appreciate you asking that question about uh, Hellman Valley Growers Company. Um, this is really near and dear to uh, members who served in uh, once was first uh, Marine Special Operations Battalion, but now known as First Raider Battalion. Uh, we were the new kids to the uh, Special Operations Command, uh, kind of quick history. You know, after the events of uh, Desert One, which was when we were. Um, uh, or sorry, Operation Eagle Claw. Um, we were going in to rescue the uh, the hostages uh, in Iran. And that was in the late 70s. And they had like SEALs and Rangers and Air Force and all these people out there, Marines. And they had a horrible accident at a, a Desert One was their first checkpoint where they had a, an air collision between two aircrafts and the mission went south clearly. They had to get out of there and it was just a very bad day for our country. Uh, seeing uh, the enemy hold up, you know, U.S. Air Force stuff and kind of shaking around like they, they did some stuff. And that's when, you know, basically the United States military said we need to form a, a group where we're all talking to each other, even though we're coming from different branches. And they started up U.S. Special Operations Command. And the Marine Corps pushed back. Uh, the Marine Corps is not a big fan of other people being in charge of Marines. So the way they kind of got through that was uh, we have a, what they call Marine Expeditionary Units um, that go out and they're all around the sailing out there. You got a battalion of Marines and they can uh, react to anything uh, relatively quick. And that kind of held the Department of Defense, you know, at bay. They're like, okay, that's fine. And, you know, you could have SEALs and Rangers and ODA guys and all that stuff kind of go on and use it as a lily pad and go off to do what they had to do. But after the events of 9-11, the uh, we really took a look at these are not going to be these big wars like we were, we were practicing against the Soviets and all this stuff. Uh, these are going to be a lot of small wars fighting a lot of small networks or a big network with a bunch of different cells splittering off of it. So we got the order that, hey, you know, Donald Rumfeld called down to the Commandant of the Marine Corps he said, I don't care what you're going to tell me, you're going to give me some special operations component. So the first thing they did is they started this unit called Detachment One or Debt One. And they put all the basically Marine recon all stars together on a on a in a platoon, and sent them over to Iraq, and they fell under uh, Naval Special Warfare or the SEALs, and it was basically our proof of concept, and they knocked it out of the park. And the NSW is like, "Yep, the Marines can do it. It's all good." So the uh, Force Reconnaissance flag went down, and the Marine Special Operations flag went up, and we were born back in 2016. Um, so for us to get our buy-in, you know, we basically had to put, we have three battalions in uh, Marine Special Operations. We put two of them in Afghanistan and one other battalion was kind of doing everything else around the globe. And first battalion was assigned to the Helmand province in, Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan. If uh, people did any research or understand uh, Afghanistan, this is not a badge of honor, but Helmand was like its own little world. It was just a highly contested area. Uh, that is where the Helmand River Valley is. It was essentially where the Taliban could have the people go out, grow poppy, cultivate it, turn to heroin, sell it, tax it, and that's how they fooled their insurgency. So it was a highly contested area. And, you know, we went in there and it was a lot of tough fighting. Uh, lost a lot, a lot of great people in there. And um, it was almost like trying to push a refrigerator up the stairs by yourself. So, you know, some one time a, a guy in the unit kind of made a 
you know, made us things like, hey, if you serve in the Helmand province uh, as a Raider, you become part of the Helmand Valley Gun, Gun Club and you get an HVGC tattoo on you. So we, when we were coming up with this concept, we really wanted to make this a military niche and really kind of celebrate veterans and who we are. And, you know, you kind of look at, you know, what we did in Helmand and, you know, I'm just not going to get too much into it, but, you know, you can always say like, well, what, what did we accomplish there? And, um, you know, again, a lot of brave men and women uh, gave all they had out there. So we wanted to pay tribute to, um, you know, all the warriors in the Helmand province. And, uh, you know, when we threw HVGC up on the wall, it came to us. I mean, I'm not kidding. It was within like five seconds. We're like, well, Helmand Valley gun or Helmand Valley growers company. And we're like, that sounds cool. So we did the right thing. We sat down with all the guys who were part of the HVGC group, explained to them what we we're going to do, said to them, hey, if you guys have a problem with this, we'll, we'll find a different name. It's not a big deal. Um, and they all embraced it. And they said, hey, when we get out, we want to get a job with you as well, because we think it's a really outstanding what you guys are doing. So uh, we put it together. And then if you guys can see the, the hat I'm wearing right here, that's, that's our logo. Obviously, we have Helen Valley Growers Company on there. And then we have our cannabis flower. Uh, but also the star constellation, you can kind of see it's called the Southern Cross. And the Southern Cross uh, star constellation you can see in the uh, South Pacific. And the Marine Raiders of World War II would have to con um, conduct night raids. And obviously, they're not using flashlights or anything like that. Didn't have night vision at those days. So they had to do celestial navigation. So they used the Southern Cross to get to and from the objective. And we really wanted to incorporate that where, again, you know, we've had a lot of brave men and women go forward and fight for us. And they're back here physically, but maybe not spiritually. And here at Helmut Valley Growers Company, we want to be that beacon in the night to help those uh, American veterans to find their way f uh, fully back home and live that American dream. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Brian Buckley of the Hellman Valor's Growing Company and of course, Battle Brothers Foundation. So uh, how can people find you and learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, so first, when you guys really want to see what's going on with the research, I encourage all of you to go to battlebrothersfoundation.org. Um, we are continuously updating our research page as soon as we're getting ready to launch. That's where you're going to find all the information in terms of if you want to participate and how to apply. Uh, we're going to get up there uh, either this weekend or early next week. Um, some FAQs and what we want to have up there is our uh, in inclusion and exclusion criteria, just so people can kind of understand where they are. Naturally, hey, we're doing this by ourselves. I don't want to sit here and have to shake my silver tin here, but if you guys want to help donate, um, we appreciate, I mean, literally every dollar counts. Um, it's, it's a big deal and you're going to change the lives of veterans. And we're not, I'll never sit here and say, hey, if you're a veteran and you're suffering with issues, you need cannabis. It's not going to be for everyone. We got to be honest about that. What we do at Bauer Brothers is more of a holistic approach. And again, I talked about the personal, medical, and economic. And we want to try to gear the program to you. I mean, if you need a job, we can help you get a job. If you're VA disability, you don't think you got what you deserve, we can help you with that. If you have someone or a loved one in trouble who might need some treatment, we can help you there. So we really try to customize it to the individual. And then also, you know, if you're here in California, please check out our website at hvgcompany.com. That's hvgcompany.com. You can go out there and check out where we're located. Uh, we do have an apparel line where we put our profits from that back into our research. We're about to launch another apparel line. That'll be coming out here in the next month or so with some really great stuff. Um, you can purchase that. And then again, if you're here and you consume in California, please purchase it. Um, it's not only just some great product and it's gonna fulfill your needs that, that you're looking for, but your money's gonna go beyond that. Your money's gonna go into helping to save, save lives of American veterans. All right, well, I wanna thank uh, you, especially Mr. Brian Buckley for taking your time out of your day and educating us all about what uh, you have going on there. I know that you are uh, a lot in, uh, in the media and on demand right now. So I thank you for taking the time with us today. And I would like to also thank uh, George Armstrong, Rico Prieta, Michael Krawitz, David Bass. And of course, uh, I wanna thank also our guest, Sonny Welch for popping in. Um, and uh, my name is Etienne Fontan. I am uh, your host tonight for Veterans Action Council Roundtable number 11, uh, basically uh, Raiders to Researchers, Pathfinders with Brian Buckley. 
I want to thank you all for being here tonight, and we wish you all the best, and we'll talk to you soon.